I am not going to welcome you at all. You've been welcomed enough at this point. You've started now. So I, I would like to actually direct our attention to that fact. You are here. You've started. And I have no idea where, except for the couple guys I met a few minutes ago, I have no idea where most of you came from. All I know is that in the providence of God, you are sitting here right now. And as much as you had to do with that, so did he. And that mystery between what he had to do and what you had to do may not be defined by us today or during your four years here. But I can tell you that you're here and you've begun. And so I want to think about what that means as we, as we spend time, a few minutes today, just 25 minutes is all I'm gonna take from you today. And we'll close in a few songs, but I want to spend a few minutes in God's word. And I want to speak about something that I think comes clearly out of a text about your, your life and your experience here at Biola. Let me just pray real quick that we would just hear from his word today. And then we'll start. Father, thank you that we could be here. And Lord, I, I, it's, it's, it's difficult because I, I don't even know so many of the people in this room. And Lord, I'm thankful that I will over these, over these years get to know several of them. But Lord, I know one thing is that in your providence, all of us are supposed to be here right now. And we thank you for that. Father, we pray that you would guide us by your spirit to help us know what our life here at Biola is supposed to look like. And even today, as we look at one text that speaks to this end, may we respond to that. I pray for them that you would give them courage. Maybe that's the word they need most this week courage, a trust in your sovereign guidance. Oh Lord, we welcome them enough. Now we want to exhort them to begin well. And we pray we can do that through your word this morning. All of this we pray, Father, in your son Jesus' name. Amen. I want to exhort you in one area, and I'm going to take you in a, a passage in the Gospel of Matthew. I don't even know if you can read out there in the darkness, but Matthew chapter 25 this would not be the normal passage you would expect someone to just jump in and talk about. It talks about the end times, like judgment and condemnation and hell. We are thinking, what's this guy going to do with this? But Jesus makes a fascinating argument in this text that I think incoming students at Biola need to hear. Like the moment that I knew I was coming to speak with you, uh, at, at this service, this was the text that I wanted to share with you. It's in Matthew chapter 25. It begins in verse 31. And in my, I've got the newest version of the NIV. My, my version entitles it, The Sheep and the Goats. I'm going to read through the whole thing and, 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 and just listen to what it says. We'll discuss various parts of it and we'll reflect on it together. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. What a, what a fascinating passage. A couple, a couple main things I want to point out as we, as we look at this. Notice the clear contrast between those who are called the sheep and those who are called the goats. And, and even the titles and, and the promises Jesus gives to them. I'm thinking of verses 34 and 35. Look at what he says. And listen to this language this morning, especially those of you who feel distant from God in one sense or need to be encouraged in your identity in him. Listen to what he says to his children. Come, look what he calls you. You who are blessed by my father. Is there a better title to have? Take your inheritance, which is what? The kingdom prepared for you since when? Since you applied at Biola? No. Since you were born? No. Since your parents were born? No. Since this country was founded? Nope. Since the creation of the world. You hear that? What a powerful statement of Jesus the shepherd calling his sheep to him. Verses 41 and 40, or at least 41 specifically, aren't as friendly to the goats. Listen to what he says. Depart from me. That's not what you want to hear from your Lord. You who are cursed. Instead of hearing come, you hear depart. Instead of hearing those blessed by my father, you hear you are cursed. Instead of something about, uh, speaking about the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, the goats hear this language. Cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you hear that? This is remarkable language. This is depicting the eschaton, the time when the judgment of Christ will come. This is big time stuff. And you may even be wondering, what is this guy doing here, taking us this first week in church, in, in Biola, in this church service today, talking about this passage of judgment? Why is he talking about the end when here we're kind of just beginning? Because Jesus makes a fascinating argument in this passage I don't want you to miss. And it's such an important argument that I think it should affect how you live all four, or for some of you, five years at Biola. Listen to what he says in verse 35. After this rich statement to the sheep, listen to what he says. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And he lists six things. Three of them are mercy. There is need. There is physical need that in some way the Christian responded to, the sheep responded to. Three of the six are more charitable, social needs. They're in prison or they're in trouble and they're responding. And these are probably just meant to be general depictions, general, a sampling of characteristics of the sheep. But look at the question the sheep asked Jesus. Verse 37, Lord, when did we see you like this? And they list those, we, hungry, uh, thirsty, something to drink, we, we, stranger. He, they, they list them all. Lord, we're not making the connection between what you're saying we did for you and what we actually did. We, we don't see it. And you can imagine anybody living after, after the life of Christ saying the exact same thing. Lord, um, you ascended a little before I was born. So let's be honest here. Like, I like the like, Bible language stuff, but you ascended way before. Now, I'm not a history major, but I can figure out I wasn't there for that. So how can this passage in any way connect to me? It, it would seem like this is only talking about the few people who are Christians around the life of Jesus' ministry. But no, Jesus takes these words, puts them on the judgment seat when all the world is standing before him, not just those in Jerusalem, not just those in the first century, but even those right here and now in Southern California in 2012 on this campus. And somehow these words are connected to you. And the question is how? And that's exactly what the sheep, those who are the righteous ones, are asking. Lord, how is this even possible? 
I'm just not seeing it. When did we? Verse 40, Jesus tells us how. I love how he's called the king. The king will reply, truly I tell you. Anytime Jesus uses those kind of preface statements, it's a statement of authority. So he's called the king. He's speaking now with authority. Listen to what he says. Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. There's the crux of this passage. There's the argument that he's making here. That's the statement I want you to metaphorically tattoo on your chest. Metaphorically, I added. Man, be aware. No extra credit in my classes. What does that mean? Who are the brothers and sisters? There's been two main interpretations given for that. Some would argue that brothers and sisters is Jesus generally speaking of all humanity, the whole world. That, that he's speaking about all humankind. So that Jesus, in a sense, is, is, is envisioning himself as being represented by all people that were around. And when we care for our neighbors and our friends and our family and, and, and people we meet on the street, we are, in a sense, caring for Jesus as if he is represented by the world. Now, several have argued for that, but I don't think that's what this is saying. The language of brothers and sisters, or depending on your translation, maybe only brothers, is very technical language in the Bible. And it stands for one group of people, the church. I don't want you to miss this. It stands for one group of people, the church. Those who are believers, i.e. fellow sheep. That in some real way, and here's the argument, this is it, this is it for today. i got a few other things to say, so don't pack up and leave, but here's the argument Jesus is making. In some real way, Jesus is represented by the body of Christ. Do you hear that? The church is the body of Christ, and what you do for that church, you are doing for him. You cannot miss this. Not when you're starting out here at Biola. Not if we at Biola are going to do for you and with you what will be appropriate. And I don't want you to miss how strong Jesus makes this. He's not saying that it's a small thing that you care for your church, your local church. He's connecting it to the judgment seat itself. What you do for them, you do for me. So much so that what you didn't do for them... You don't do for him. See that language we read earlier in verse 41 and 42, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire. This isn't a joke. This isn't kind of, you know what would be kind of nice, like an add-on to your spiritual life? You know what would be really cool? If you just once in a while did some church stuff. No. Cursed language, eternal fire language is connected to the body of Christ. And what you didn't do for these, you didn't do for Christ. Even in verse 45, notice what Jesus says. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And I cannot tell you, and I will press this on us for the rest of our, my time here this morning, I cannot tell you how important local church is. And I am so glad this is the only time, and it better be, and then with that, I would support that you will be worshiping on Sunday morning in this gym. The local church is where you must be. I cannot express that enough. We were in Yosemite a few weeks ago. Anybody, just scream. I can barely see it beyond the light. Anybody been to Yosemite? Scream before. Have you been there? Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I'm in a lake with, my, with my, my oldest son, who's seven and a half, a river. So we're in a river, and the, it, it, was, it was lower than previous years, and we are like going through and climbing over rocks and getting sucked down little waterfalls and having a blast. And later that day, guess what I'm finding missing on my finger? That's right, my wedding ring. Gone. 13 years. The wife is still there, don't worry. I mean, <laughs> she's still there. I mean, that, that, that didn't change. But the ring, gone. Some grizzly bear is wearing it now, I'm pretty sure. 
It's in Yosemite, shining somewhere or something. It, it must be. That's where we were. I, looked, I checked our tent. I checked backpack. See if my little newborn baby swallowed it, everything. Nothing came out of the diapers. It's gone. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. I never took it off. I'm not the kind of guy that played with it and did this kind of thing and behind the back. I just wore it. For 13 years, I, it, it never slipped off, nothing. So I'm, being in 40-something degree water must have shrunk my finger and made it disappear. And it was kind of interesting to reflect on the symbol of the ring. In one sense, it's just a symbol. I, I remember feeling this kind of sinking feeling in my gut when I realized it was gone, and I walked over to my wife, and I was a little nervous about this, not because necessarily I thought I was going to get in trouble or something, but I thought that a little bit, but I, 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 held up my, I held up my finger and she went, no. And I was just waiting to see what's the response gonna be. But see, see, she knows I don't play with it. She knows I don't put it by the bedside table or leave it in the refrigerator or something. I mean, I don't do any of that stuff. It, it was gone, she knows that. So she said, well, she says, I, I guess we'll just have to get you a new one. I'm like, whew, that was good. See, the, the ring is not the marriage, is it? The ring's not the marriage. Now, I want that ring. It signifies something to me personally. It signifies something to my wife. A new one's coming, and we'll get it next week. And my wife even said, as with the first one, she'd like to be the one to put it on my finger. It's real. It symbolizes something real, but it's not the real thing. I can lose it. It's gone. The funny thing is, I love this about my little boys, and we've got a little girl that just turned one, and she'll probably figure this out too. My boys know it means something. When they were real young, they would sit in my lap, and they would hold, my hand would be there, and they'd be putting their hand in mine. They're their small little hands, and their little chubby fingers would point to that ring, and they'd say, Mommy loves daddy. And then they'd be in her lap and they'd point at her ring and they'd say, daddy loves mommy. It symbolized something that was real. Guess what? They never learned that from the ring. It's not there's a little sign that comes up that says daddy loves mommy. None of that. <laughs> there's not some like insignia that glows in fire that says daddy loves I mean, none, none of that is there. How did they learn that about the ring? They saw daddy love mommy. It's connected to something real. It itself is not real. So my kids weren't bawling when the, when the ring was gone. They were they're like, my oldest like, dad, did you tell mom? You know, that was about it. But it was, it was anything. It was just kind of like, whoa, are you going to get a new one? Can we pick it out? You going to get a Chicago Bears one or something, dad? I mean, we, I mean, I mean that, that, that was it. Why? Because they knew in the tent that night in Yosemite, their little sister was in a pack and play. They were cuddling together in this little sleeping bag, and on the other end of the tent was mom and dad. Nothing had changed. But I want to tell you, I have a feeling some of us treat church like a wedding ring. It's a symbol. And the real thing is somewhere else. The local church is expendable because as long as we have this me and Jesus thing and all these other resources, we feel like that's expendable. Wear it or not, I, know a lot, I don't know what your, what your dads do or men in your life, but I know a lot of men don't even wear wedding rings. And it doesn't mean they're unfaithful. They do, my brother-in-law's an electrician. It's a dangerous thing to wear a wedding ring. Don't wear it. I'd like you to live, his wife thinks. And, and, or or they're just uncomfortable. Or, or There's lots of different things you can do, but they're symbols of something greater. But the local church is not a symbol. It isn't just kind of imaging what you really are somewhere else. No, according to this text, it's as real as Jesus. It's connected to him intimately. In fact, I think the wedding ring imagery is potent because you are the bride of Christ. And the church is that bride. It's not the ring, it's the bride. And how dare you confuse those? And I am, I am very concerned that we have a generation of evangelicals who have treated the church like a wedding ring that can be disposed of or replaced, it's lost, and it's not a big deal. No, it's not a symbol. It's the bride. So if I lost my wife in Yosemite, that would be a bigger problem. <laughs> and I wouldn't have a kid asking if I was gonna get a Chicago Bears one. They would say, where's mom? I lost her in the river. <laughs> I checked the tent, she's not there. I can get a new one though. 
that doesn't work that way, does it? And the, the reason you laugh is because conceptually you know the ring is expendable. The wife is not. But then how come we have hordes of young Christians not going to church? I don't understand this. That's part of my own story. When I came to, to a Christian college my first semester, I got away from my parents. I didn't go the whole first semester. I, I, just, I, I think I saw church as a symbol of something, like that ring. I was, it was independent. I was rebelling a bit. I, I, would, I wasn't thinking through all this, but I was 18 years old. And I was doing my own thing. And by the end of the semester, it, at least as I look back, and it, God grabbed me by the shirt collar and said, who do you think I am? And who do you think you are? And that last Sunday of my first semester in college, I went to church. And that, other than just average illness and things, that's the last time I've missed over half my life. But for some reason, it seemed expendable to me. I was wrong. Even worse, I was sinning. I thought it was expendable, and it is not. You, brothers and sisters, must connect to a local church in this area and be committed believers, members, and participants. I don't just say this because you're going to bring a wealth of resources, because you might play piano, or because you can sing, or you can teach, or you can work in the nursery. I'm assuming and hoping you'll bring a lot of who you are there. I'm saying you're blessed, and you're loving Jesus, not just when you do devotions, not just when you're worshiping and sing spo, and go to those. Those are wonderful. But Biola is so ramped up and so skilled at serving the church, we can all of a sudden make it look like you don't need it. And we're killing you. We're killing you. And you won't hear that from anybody here. But we do it so good, and because you probably have viewed church as more like a ring than your wife, you don't mind losing it a bit. And I'm telling you, you're sinning. I don't know how else to say it. It's not, it's, not just a, it's not just a rebuke thing. It's a sin. And so you need to go. Don't be like me and make it the last Sunday of your first semester that you go to your church. Make it the first Sunday of your first semester. And you might have to, you, it, it, you, it's a pain. You're going to have to meet people. And, and they're going to be older, right? And, they're going to be, and there's going to be little kids. And, there's going to, it, it, I, and you've got so many new things. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you that the Lord himself is saying to you, that is where you are. And if you are not going to church, I don't care what chapel program you're serving in, how much TA work you're doing. I don't care if you're evangelizing every hole in Horton. I don't I don't care. If you're cleaning every window and all the dorms, if you're getting every door, you are not loving me if you're not doing that in my church. And I believe that. And I can't even imagine the impact. I mean, just a subsidiary point. I can't imagine the impact Biola could have in local churches in L.A. and Orange County. I can't imagine because you know what you will be? You will be where you belong, at home. You will learn to do your religious and spiritual growth where you will do it long after you leave. And I'm concerned that some of our graduates don't know how to grow spiritually after they leave here. And what scares me more than anything is when I hear from one of our seniors that the, the, who've, who've graduated, some of our alumni, they, 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 they come back and they say, oh, hi, how you doing? I say, and they're like, oh, I've never been fed like I, like I was fed at Biola. And I worry about that. Are you even able to be fed by somebody else? Or does it have to be with 1,000 or 1,500 of your own peers? You need to be by old people a little bit. You need to go to weddings and funerals. You need to have kids running around. Multi-generational, multi-ethnic, local body under the authority of pastors and elders and teachers. You need that. And you need to serve. You need to serve in a real way. We had a, a guy in our church, a family in our church, a, a mom and her son, and uh, they were from Africa. This is his last semester. This story I'm telling you is, is hot off the press. It happened last semester in my church in, in, in Brea, where I live and go to church. And this mom was dying of cancer. 
Her husband wouldn't come to the church. He was from Africa. He was from a different denomination, and he didn't understand. But I go to an evangelical free church of America, EFCA, just an average evangelical church. He was Lutheran, so the husband wouldn't go to the church. But the wife, for some reason, something at our church felt real. So she took her seven-year-old son, same age as my son, seven-year-old son, they would go to church. The husband wouldn't go. The wife was dying of cancer. Now, they're from, a, they're from Africa, and in their culture, they don't talk and can't talk about death. So guess what? They never told the son she was dying. They never told him. The father wouldn't tell him. The mother wouldn't tell him. None of his Sunday school teachers could talk about it, so people in the church knew about it, but they, couldn't, but they wouldn't talk about it. In fact, they had a hard time even talking about it to people at church. But guess what we found out in our church? As she's dying of cancer and she's on a deathbed, she can't cook, she can't clean, she's got a seven-year-old son, and she's got a husband who's got to commute to L.A. every day. So what did people in our church do? Scores of women volunteered to take a day without being asked, getting permission, of course, without, without a big request, they would go to her house, they would clean her floors, they would clean her toilet, they would clean her living room, they would care for her, they would drop the son off at school, they would pick him up from school, they would make dinner, and the moment the husband came home, they would be gone. Scores of women, and do you know how many of them are college students? A good many. And do you know two of them go to this school? They don't get any credit for that. They don't get any extra credit for that. But they were serving this woman. And she passed away in May. And the son was a bit surprised. And the father, who had not attended our church, but had seen for months one church body extend themselves to his family, decided not to call his Lutheran pastor, but to call ours. And he walked into our church building on a Sunday morning, the Sunday after she was gone, with his little boy, who was happy to see his friends, one being my little son. And he looked us in the eye and he said, what is it about you that's so different from others? Jesus told us what. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. I want you to go to your chapels. You need to, really, but I want you to go anyway. I want you to go even more. I want you to be on uh, dorm Bible studies. I want you to go to extracurricular activities. I want you to have Bible studies with your friends. I want you to do RA meetings. I want you to be doing your devotions. I do, but I want you to be the bride of Christ first and foremost. It's not a ring you wear. It's your marriage to him. And this one you better not lose. I pray that you do that. I, 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 and I say this here, I pray. I've already been praying for the students I'll have in my classes. I have already been praying that they would plug into a local church. And you can bet that they, and if, you, if you're in one of those classes, you'll hear from me again, because I will say this again. Because I'm concerned about your marriage to Christ. And unfortunately, we're living in a divorce epidemic, and I'm not just talking about between men and women. Let's pray. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.